Excuse me, there's an equivalent uh, availability to the communications media of the same sort of uh, public ask access to those rooms in the White House that are open to the public, but that might require uh, special arrangements for you to make to set up your television cameras or yes. something else uh, at an hour when the public, in fact, is not there. Yes. Just in order to, in order to preserve... Exactly. Uh, we have no quarrel with the court's holdings in Pell and Saxby. Uh, there was rather full access there. Reporters could enter the institutions, counter, take photographs. The only thing they couldn't do the only purpose for which access was denied was to single out individual prisoners and make media heroes out of them, have them interviewed, have them come to public attention. The evidence in that case was that that indeed created security problems. The court upheld that narrow restriction on access, but there was certainly sufficient access to prevent concealment of conditions in, in that prison. And we don't have any quarrel either with the broad no greater access statement of the court in those cases, provided that it's understood that there is sufficient access to prevent concealment. Well, how far does your argument go? Uh, uh, there are many areas when, when you agree that to, to which the public does not in fact have access, uh, let's say the Oval Office in the White House. Yes. Not no general right of access by the general public at any time during the 24 hours of each day of a seven-day week. Uh, and uh, to that extent, there's, there's no access period. Now, uh, to that extent, the public doesn't know what goes on there. That's right. Uh, it knows only through press officers at the White House. Uh, and yet, does, does, that, does that mean that for some reason or another, the fact that the public isn't admitted at all, that the press then must be? No. Well, then what is your argument? Well, let's, assume, we're not, let's assume in this particular county jail, the public was not admitted at all, except in terms of the, as the general public, members of the families were and, and the lawyers were and doctors were. Uh, but the general public, no. By that very fact, does the press then gain access? That seems to be your argument. Yes, it is. Well, well, that, that was, that. Well, that was the situation before this case was filed. Yes, not only was the public... We're talking not about policy or prudential uh, uh, considerations or wisdom or lack of it. We're talking about what is required by the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Yes. Else this case shouldn't be here. That's right. And why, then? Why, then, does the mere fact that the public does not have access and thereby confer a right upon the press access? That's well, a brand new doctrine that I've never heard of. If both press and public were wholly excluded, as they were before this case was filed... And as they are from many areas uh, of public life, of, of governmental life. They're excluded from the war room over in the Pentagon, I assume. Indeed, should be. Various parts of the CIA. Has been point, has it been well, something else? The, the difference between those kinds of closed institutions and this one are two. First, the information which um, is being discussed in the CIA and various government agencies which you've mentioned is information that properly should not be made public. While here, what's going on in this jail is information that has no claim to confidentiality. How do you know what should be properly made public and what has no claim to confidentiality under the First and Fourteenth Amendment? Well, there's no claim at all by the sheriff that anything that happens in this jail should be held secret from the public. Well, but you, you have to make out your claim under the First and Fourteenth Amendments of the Constitution. So when you say that something has no claim to confidentiality, that must be a part of the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Otherwise, you can't prevail. Well, what, what I'm saying is that we don't seek access to information that has any claim to confidentiality. Well, there may be other reasons uh, that the public is not given access, in, 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 aside from confidentiality. Uh, the reasons of security, of discipline, of the very fact that a jail is a jail. Indeed, uh, to the extent uh, there's a governmental uh, interest. A, a, could, a, a commander of a, of a military station could certainly keep members of the public uh, uh, out of uh, uh, observing certain uh, troop activities, I assume. Yes, of course, when there's a, a governmental well, interest. Well, yes, 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 discipline well, of course, we, can, the troops. we concede that. We, we believe that the proper test is the one that this court used in Martinez before that of O'Brien, where there is a governmental interest, whether the interest is confidentiality of the information or security problems or some other important governmental interest, of course access can be denied. Maybe part of the punitive uh, policy of a particular governmental agency might be that in this jail you're not going to have members of the general public around. We're going to this is a maximum security institution, and one of the conditions in this jail is that you're not going to be uh, able to associate even peripherally with members of the general public. Why wouldn't that be a perfectly legitimate governmental interest? Well, it may be, but this sheriff has never advanced that consideration. He certainly well, does he doesn't not have to. He doesn't. Uh, you're, it's you who are attacking what he's done. It's that, your, that's right. You who are saying what he's done is unconstitutional, and, violating the United States Constitution. And that's he doesn't have to justify it. You have to invalidate it. The district court invalidated it because it found that the interests advanced by the sheriff were, though important, the means of exclusion that he used were not necessary to serve any of his interests. Of course, if uh, access has to be denied during an emergency, no question about it. That's built into the district court's order. All the district court said is reasonable times. We see that as meaning on reasonable notice. And the sheriff may completely refuse access at any time when he thinks, in his discretion, according to the district court's order, uh, tensions in the jail would, uh, would authorize him to close it down. Mr. Turner, in answer to Mr. Justice Stewart's question about the difference between what you claim your rights are here and the interest in finding out what happens in governmental conferences where there's secrecy, like you said, there are two differences. There's an absence of interest in confidentiality here, and there is an interest in confidentiality in these other cases, but you never got your second. The second one is that this is an institution <coughs> whose purpose is the involuntary confinement of people uh, with an opportunity for overreaching of, of liberties of the people who are involuntarily confined, and very little opportunity for that to come to public knowledge unless reporters are, are permitted in. Don't each of those people have a right of access to a lawyer? Well, uh, some uh, would be represented by the public defender uh, if they are pretrial detainees. The other half of the prisoners who are convicted in serving of misdemeanor sentences or short felony terms uh, do not, as I understand it, have a right to, uh, to counsel. But hasn't this court held they have right of access to court at any rate? Yes. Oh, they, oh, of course, and they could uh, mail off to the court a writ of habeas corpus. Uh, but that's not uh, a way of bringing to public attention uh, the sheriff's stewardship of this facility. Well, it seems, why isn't it? Why isn't it? Well, uh, it might, if, if the writ were heard. Well, it might be on, way of doing precisely that. On the evidence. But uh, that's just not uh, what happens when prisoners file these writs. They don't hold a plenary hearing and inquire into conditions. Probably 99% of the writs are denied summarily with no hearing at all. And they're filed in the court and matters of public record available to the president. Yes, they would be. Is there anything to prevent every prisoner in the institution, whether a pretrial detainee or under a conviction, from writing a long, long letter to his wife or his mother or his lawyer and having that published in the letters to the editor? Well, uh, this, the sheriff doesn't prevent it. What prevents it is, is the responsibility uh, of journalism. They are not going to print uh, unsubstantiated information received from a prisoner, whether by letter or otherwise, without an opportunity to verify the allegations made by the prisoner. That's what's missing here. Can't go in. The prisoner says there's been a terrible fire in the next cell and somebody's been badly injured. Nobody can get in to find that out. Can't you go in to interview him on a particular day? Well, you can visit a sentence prisoner during the three-hour visiting period on Sundays. Couldn't you verify or corroborate his story or further develop it in such an interview? Yes, but you, you could not see the scene. You have no idea what the conditions look like. Um, should the press take the prisoner's word for what it looks like and what happened
And certainly my client thinks not. Well, should the press take the president's press secretary's word for what the president's views are without going to the Oval Office and checking him out? Well, that's the way they do business over there. No. Well, this is the way they do business now. We're dealing here with a constitutional issue. The president of the United States cannot be required to meet the press by any constitutional. What about the United States Senator? Senator? How about the United States Senator? There are normally 100 of them. No, I don't think any, any court could order a senator to sit down and meet with the press. 435 members of the House. We're, we're not trying to use the First Amendment as a Freedom of Information Act. We're not saying the sheriff has to come out and meet the press or open his files or tell us when anything happened. He just can't shut the door to us on the ground that all that's required is equality, even if that equality is zero. Uh, well, but to the, the only issue is whether this injunction is a, uh, but to giving the a special privilege to the press is a, uh, constitutionally required. Well, we, we don't want a special privilege. What we want is access sufficient to prevent concealment of the well, I know, that's what you've got. And if you say you're defending the Court of Appeals' opinion, you must defend that proposition. Yes. Because they said they expressly held that, that a special uh, privilege to the press uh, was uh, quite proper. Yes, we're also defending the district court's order, which provides for reasonable access and authorizes the sheriff to well, figure out just how that access that may be so, but in this case, the only issue is a, the special privilege to the press. That's the only question that was in the petition for certiorari. That's the way the sheriff poses the issue. Well, that's the one we granted. Whether, whether the Constitution... And why should uh, we listen to any other question? Well, I'm not, is, you, is that a correct statement of the question? The question presented is whether the district court erred in granting a preliminary injunction. The question doesn't ask about the form of the preliminary injunction, does it? Whether or not any injunction should have been granted. Well, well, no, yes, but, but this injunction does speak in terms of access for reporters. But does the other side consider the relief requested by the other side is a vacation of the entire injunction, not a change in its terms? Exactly. They want a reversal, which will be a message to jailers throughout this land that access is never required by the Constitution. That's the position we propose. Well, I still ask you what you think the question presented by the petition for certiorari is, and that is before the court. I wouldn't doubt that the sheriff would like to get the press out of his hair. Uh, but uh, the issue here is, uh, is whether he can do that. Yes, and the Court of Appeals said the remedy granted by the district court, uh, giving special access to the press, was not an abuse of discretion. <laughs> he said it was quite proper and apparently thought it was constitutionally required. Otherwise, I don't know how the, uh, the district judge had any business ordering the press, uh, uh, ordering the sheriff to, uh, to uh, issue uh, special access to the press. Well, what was constitutionally... must have thought it was constitutionally required in the First Amendment. Well, what was constitutionally impermissible was the sheriff's exclusion. Well, you can put it that way if you want, but I gather then that you think the Constitution required the injunction Sorry. that was issued by the district court. It required some access, and the district some court... Some special access. That's what it did. Different access for the press than for the public at large, no doubt about that. Well, that's uh, the issue here, isn't But it? how that access is implemented was expressly left to the sheriff to determine in the first instance under the district court's order. We hope that the, upon remand of the district court, to work out all the details so that uh, uh, these conditions will never again escape public scrutiny. Sure. Well, I didn't quite go as planned. Uh, Stewart, the key guy, is skeptical of a brand new argument I never heard of. White is totally openly hostile and so on. As I said in the book, the, in the figures book, uh, the old chestnut about Supreme Court arguments is that for every Supreme Court argument, there are actually three. It's the one that you prepare in the weeks or months before argument that is carefully outlined, that covers all the points, that anticipates the justice's question, that is orderly and logical and works. Then there's the argument that is actually given in court, where you are interrupted and you stumble and you bumble, bumble and you stutter and you never get to most of the points on the outline and completely a shambles. And then the third argument is the one that comes to you in the taxi on the way back to your hotel after the argument. The brilliant stroke that would have taken that question and turned it around and you march off with a triumph before the court. Well, I have to say that in the 33 years uh, since that argument, that brilliant stroke has never occurred to me. Uh, I don't know how this case could have been won before that court. Uh, and the decision in the, uh, in the court was uh, what you might have expected from the questioning, uh, with Chief Justice Berger writing the majority opinion, or the plurality opinion, uh, Justice Stevens, with his friendly questioning during argument, writing the dissent, and ever the man in the middle, Potter Stewart, stuck in the middle, uh, where he concurs that there's no First Amendment right of access to not just a jail, but to government facilities and information. Uh, but, he says, uh, still KQED was entitled to some access, as long as the sheriff permitted the public some access, which he did through the tours. Um, that's a complicated position that he took, one that requires more explication, and it's one that we'll take up on Thursday and then follow the rest of the access scenario up to date. So uh, let, me, let me say, I was thinking about your paper as I was thinking about KQED thing. It's a past tense paper. It's a past tense article. You're reporting what the Supreme Court decided yesterday. So it's not the court thinks, or the court believes, or Justice X reasons. It's all past tense. He reasoned the court did this, the court did that, past tense. And don't mix up the tenses with future or present if you're writing in the past tense. That's my avuncular advice for the day. So see you Thursday.